Greetings, welcome back. How hard is the Collatz conjecture? Probably pretty hard, because it's still an open problem after all these decades. But how hard is it compared to other math problems? In a 2011 blog post, mathematician Terence Tao actually gave a solid answer to this question. So let's check it out. Consider proposition A. For any powers of 2 and 3, their difference has to be bigger than 1. Well, uh, k and x are integers here, and we're just going to consider the cases where the left-hand side is positive. It's actually easy to prove the difference can't be 1. Gersonides did it in the year 1343, and we covered that earlier in this channel. Now consider proposition b. For all integers k and x, 2 to the k minus 3 to the x is greater than a half of x. That is, the powers of 2 and 3 inexorably grow further and further apart as they get bigger. Can you prove this? If you could, then you'd know that this can't equal that without having to work out the arithmetic, not just for this case, but for any case where uh, the right-hand side is less than 1 half x. Now, Terence Tao came up with a striking result. He said, if you can't prove proposition B, then you can't prove the Collatz conjecture. Okay, that's super sobering news for a math kook because proposition B is known to be very hard. It's a watered down version of Alan Baker's heavy artillery theorem showing that two to the K minus three, the X grows exponentially in X, but not too watered down, says Tao. Uh, it seems to require the same transcendental math that won Baker the Fields Medal in the 1960s. So Terence Tao is basically saying that the Collis conjecture is Baker hard, meaning that solving it would automatically prove proposition B as a side effect, meaning the college conjecture is harder than proposition B, which is Fields Metal hard. Okay, so how does Tao actually show this? Okay, first suppose you prove the college conjecture. Now Tao takes any claim of the form 2 to the k minus 3 to the x equals n, where n is less than a half x. And for any such claim, he mechanically converts it into a Collatz counterexample loop. But since you've proved the Collatz conjecture, no such counterexample loop can exist. Therefore, by contradiction, this claim here must be false. And Tao's conversion method not only refutes this claim, but also every claim like it, which establishes the truth of proposition B as a side effect of your Collatz conjecture proof. So this is sobering because if you're working on Collatz and you've never heard of Proposition B, you're necessarily going to have to invent or reinvent some method to solve it, uh, which is a feat that would have earned you a Fields Medal in the 1960s. So let's understand how Tau converts a claim like this into a Collatz loop like this. We take the claim and first create a loop shape that looks like this. Up, down, up, down, up, down, so on, and then up, 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 up. The loop has length k with x up moves. Up means do 3n three, three plus 1 over 2, and down means n over 2. Just follow the Collatz rule. It turns out that only one number m uh, follows this sequence and loops back on itself. And here's the formula for m. It's kind of a hairy formula, but we've covered it a lot on this channel before. The main point is that beta v is a sum of products uh, where a increases while b decreases. And here's some examples. 1 means up and 0 means down. Now, if beta uh, v is a multiple of 2 to the k minus 3 to the x, then m is obviously an integer, so this is a real bona fide Collatz counterexample. And the reason no one's found such a counterexample is that m always seems to be a fraction, not an integer. Okay, back to Tau's conversion procedure. Say we receive a claim like 2 to the k minus 3 to the x equals 5. Uh, we mechanically create a Collatz loop shape, V, like this. If X is even, then V is a bunch of ones followed by a bunch of zeros, and if X is odd, V is this. And we can verify in all cases that beta V is a multiple of five, so M's an integer, and we have a Collatz counterexample loop. Well, that proves a special case of proposition B, namely that two to the K minus three to the X is greater than five. Hold on, we, we only refuted this. We need to refute these also, but that's easy because uh, it can't be 1 because of Gersonides, and it can't be even because it's an even minus an odd, and it can't be divisible by 3 either. Okay, so what about the general case of Proposition B? We could build special converters to handle claims where the 
n is 5, 7, 11, and so on, which is kind of fun, but we need a general construction. Uh, so here we go. Take x ones and k minus x zeros and arrange them into a loop shape like this. Call it w. Now beta of w might already be a multiple of n, in which case we're done, so we have a collapse counterexample loop. But if it isn't, no worries. We're going to modify shape w into a new shape v, where beta v is guaranteed to be a multiple of n. We have at least n places where we can swap up down for down up. And it happens that some combination of swaps will do the job. And the reason is that each swap changes beta by adding a sum 2 to the i times 3 to the j, a change that's co prime to n, because as we saw earlier, n can't be even or 3 even. Which means, according to some fancy theorem of Cauchy from the early 1800s, that some combination of swaps will result in adding just enough beta to beta w to bring it up to zero mod n, meaning we've created a new loop shape where m is an integer, a counter example to the Collett's conjecture. So no matter what claim we get of this form, we can produce a counter example loop. And if you've already proved no such loop exists, then the claim is refuted. Not just that claim, but all claims like it, thereby establishing Proposition B, a very powerful and deep result in pure mathematics. So good job. <laughs> OK, now for some good news. Maybe proving the Collett's conjecture is only a little bit harder than proving Proposition B. And since Baker already proved Proposition B, maybe we could just use Baker's result in our Collett's proof. So that's good. Now, if Tau had said that the Collett's conjecture was harder than proving the unsolved Riemann hypothesis, well, that'd be truly sobering news for a math kook, and I'd probably just quit. But he didn't, and so I won't. Okay, see you next time.